David Ben-Gurion was in fact a radical Marxist. He was part of a group called Paul Zion. Paul Zion was instrumental in the communist revolution in Russia. And when he was younger, he used to actually frequently rob wealthier citizens. Then he <clears> immigrated <throat> in the wake of the pogroms. He immigrated to Palestine. And he was instrumental in something called Hebrew labor. And he was also a proponent of segregation, of segregating Arabs and Jews, which eventually just gradually started to manifest. Hebrew labor, for those who don't understand, what that is specifically is the concept that you only employ Jews. You do right. not employ Arabs. There were these underhanded land purchases taking place. And then once this large land was purchased, all of the Palestinians that worked it, what they actually had back then was more communally owned lands. So these people for generations that had been working this land, where I live now, but eventually some slick politicians are going to come here and with the whisk of a pen, they're going to be able to get a hold of that land. Really what happened in Palestine in many ways that people don't recognize, it wasn't about Jews and Muslims. Uh, that was nowhere near the, the reality of what was really going on. The bigger thing was a clash of civilizations where you had mm. this Western imperialism and it knew the yeah. assignment from the beginning, which was mm -hmm. economical conquest, which was subjugation. And the Palestinian population was not at all prepared. Welcome to Fire Out with Faust, everybody. I am Faust Ticho, and today I am excited and delighted to be joined by my brother from another mother once again, Gavin Nascimento. He is an intelligence analyst like no other, a conspiracy realist. He is known and renowned for his incredible attention to detail and adherence to facts, and he is a meticulous researcher and analyst. Okay. Um, he doesn't deal in theories. He sticks to what he can prove with evidence and his reputation reflects that. And the people who follow him know that and count on him. And he, I encourage you if, you, if you are not following him across his social media presence and platforms, you should. Um, he will help keep you informed. So Gavin, my brother, welcome back. It is a pleasure to have you on the show. Let's, let's catch up, my man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the very kind introduction and looking forward to this, man. It is going to be a hell of a roller coaster. <laughs> and I'll yeah, do my best to, to steer the wheel as effectively <laughs> as I can. <laughs> I'll try to help navigate, my man. Um, you know, there's just uh, so much going on. You know, it's a it's a, it's a shit storm. Um, yeah. And it's it's just terrible what's what's going on. It's terrible. The amount of casualties that we're up to uh, it's terrible that there is an embargo on a, an entire swath of, of <clears> over <throat> a million people who are um literally starving uh, and, and that the world is i shouldn't say the world because a lot of the world is waking up a lot of americans are still justifying um what's happening I, and that is the sense i get on social media the the majority of people are still um and it could be it could be the base that I built on IG that tends to fall into this <laughs> category. Yeah, look, you know, I, I, it's I, weird. I, you know? I think what's really tricky about all of this, right, is within our field, within the dimension that we work, is some very influential, otherwise sensible individuals that generally are a voice of reason and rationality that are fucking bizarrely and almost blindly siding with Israel, yeah. such as, let's say, for example, Jordan Peterson or Ben Shapiro. Yeah. Now, these are otherwise very sensible, critical thinkers, but the reality for somebody who's really dug deeply into this, and I've, I've listened to the videos from both Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro, the fact of the matter is, and I'm just going to be called a spade a spade, I admire their work, especially Jordan Peterson, well, yeah. I'm very disappointed in both of their presentations and recently. I can tell you, though, listening to both of them, they have no idea what the fuck they're talking about. They <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, that's the reality. Yeah, I, I'm, look, I, I've, I can say that with confidence. Like, since the last um, interviews we did several months ago, 
taken a quantum leap then in my awareness of precisely yeah. what's going on there the history and so on and so forth and so when i listen to them speak now i don't necessarily believe in fact i'm quite confident that it's not intentional malevolence or insidiousness on their no. part i think it's unconscious tribalism and it's just once again a testament to the fact that irrespective of how intelligent somebody is because they both are extremely intelligent people yeah. irrespective of that you can still succumb to the trappings of tribalism so we need to be mindful of that at all times absolutely and and uh, you know i just have to point this out because the, the other thing i see that creates um let's just call it a blind spot in many people intelligent people is uh, the religious underpinning of tr and, and the tribalism and, and that mentality that it creates because 100 percent it is very difficult to overcome you know what i what i would you know that kind of belief system once it's ingrained and and i think that's very apparent all you have to do is listen to ben shapiro's idea <laughs> and and quote knowledge that he spews about hey, dude, israel bro. you know and and you're just i'm just like it's and people think that yeah. this you know it's it's it is painful now and and you know people are like well he's really really smart i'm like yeah he he's he's smart as a whip but but he he is misinformed about a great many things and, you, and, and at you the know. end of the day that cat is he's book smart and the thing about yeah. books is unless you've read all of them which nobody has you're going to have a very limited worldview you're going to have a keyhole worldview and i can tell you that what he echoes that's why I don't think it's intentional malevolence or insidiousness. What he echoes is generally the kind of propaganda that gets fed to the average Jewish person or even the Jewish academic. Yeah. Because yeah. like I listened to his so-called, you know, he, he had a recent thing on his YouTube channel. It's called Facts. And he talks about what's really going on <laughs> in Palestine. Yeah, no, it's mind-blowing. Facts. And, and yeah. then I watched a, a longer one that he did two years ago, like an hour long watched both of them on several occasions paused stopped it was very painful to listen to but he omits such remarkably incriminating information <clears throat> that again i don't think it's intentional insidiousness uh, but if it is that's problematic big time but i don't think yeah. it is i think it's just that he has massive blind spots however in the midst of what's taking place now where there is this convergence of information there's no excuse not for him to look into the other yeah. side of this debate because it's insurmountable you know it's it's yeah. almost like the debate between the analogy i used in the past when people were propounding the lockdowns what i compared mm. that to was the theoretical evidence justifying lockdowns was like an anthill made out of sand <laughs> whereas the the peer-reviewed credentialed science spanning decades showing how dangerous and deadly lockdowns were is like a mountain. You can't you yeah. cannot compare the two. And that's where we are when you really dig into things, that's what that's what you become faced with historically yeah. and in the modern context in relation to Palestine and Israel. Yeah. And unfortunately, this general knowledge you know i mean academia is controlled by the money and ben ben shapiro has you know all kinds of credits um to his name all in the you know based in the academic world and his views reflect that um unfortunate bias but let's get let's get into it my man let's get into because there is a hidden history here that most people D damn yeah, i would say i would say 95 percent of it is hidden history really very well hidden and, and methodically left out of the history books you know and there's this great big veil that's been pulled over this planet about god's chosen land right and and this notion that look i was born and raised catholic so i i understand that israel has an, an important had an important role but but we are we are muddying the waters here you know i mean we're talking about a nation funded and started by the rothschild banking dynasty you know and it's amazing to me that christians <laughs> continue to go to bat and justify and defend genocide on this scale because they imagine that this is somehow biblically 
you know in doubt um, yeah yeah you know what i'm saying yeah, so, it's, so it's crazy let's get it's into it because this is like so, you said the, there's a disturbing ideology that has roots in some of the most dangerous yeah. isms that are out there it's it's profoundly so the, the state of israel itself is the total inversion of what we have been told to believe it is which is this religiously favored um, divine kind of sanctioned state the fact of the matter is the founding fathers of the state of israel were radical marxists and also they were compared of course today it's like blasphemy but radical fascists that's the reality mm -hmm. if you look at the actual history which hopefully we'll get to detail that that's what we're dealing with and these were non-religious jews and then in relation to the christian zionist ideology behind it the first proponents of settling resettling jews in palestine in the area that we now call israel was in fact christian zionist from the british empire but it was for geostrategic reasons and, and we'll get into yeah. that also in a moment but just very quickly there's a lot of things so anybody that is listening to this i highly encourage them to listen to the other two podcasts that we did as well yeah because one of the fundamentals that we i think was actually in the first podcast that we touched on sorry i'm yeah in the woods and these insects crawling on me and stuff <laughs> one of the no first things we touched on was what is certainly to me the foundation that needs to be addressed first and foremost you have to um, go right to the root of the issue and this is this alleged divine covenant with the patriarch of the abrahamic religions now just very quickly because i'm going to refer to people to their podcast i don't want to reinvent the wheel yes. like we went through that but the patriarch was a guy by the name of abraham okay Abraham was born in Mesopotamia, boys and girls, which is Iraq. He didn't even come from Palestine. He didn't even come from that region. The author then claims that he's that God is promising this land to you. Okay, now, when I say the author, some people will say Moses, but the reality is it's a point of contention because you cannot author your own death, which is what happens in the first five books. Okay? Right. Now, Moses, allegedly Moses, or the author of the publication, he claims, oh, you know, God said that we, we he promises you this land. That sounds fantastic, right? <laughs> gonna go there this almost is the the myth before the myth about um a land without people for a people without land that kind of mm -hmm. shit right yeah well eventually as the story progresses it degenerates into a literal act of genocide so at first it's about giving the land and then as they get closer and closer well the author starts saying look man you're gonna have to go into this land and you are gonna have to kill every man every woman every child that even literally says infant infant <laughs> and they even talk about killing all the cattle don't leave anything alive breathing and i encourage Where does it anybody, say that again um let me you know what i've got that in i've got that in the original slides so just give me a, a moment shall. okay again people can refer to the first one that we did um but i've got it just somewhere just bear with me for a moment Slide while you show. while you look for that let me just say this yeah any book that says that God said to kill is a book that you should throw out. Not a book you should believe in. Because I'll tell you right now, God would never say that. All right? God loves exactly. all his that, creatures. My, my, my thoughts, exactly. It's, you know, I'll, let me touch on that in a moment. Okay, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, is I'm going to just tell people to refer to the first podcast because I okay. did cite it. I gave... The sources okay, and the citations right. that I don't want to get hung up in. But in relation to what you're saying specifically, right? Let, let's just assess the logic. First of all, the moment uh, this violates the golden rule, this violates one of the basic tenets of every Abrahamic mm -hmm. religion, and even that which precedes and transcends religion, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The moment you hear somebody say that babies deserve to be killed because they are innately evil, the difference between... Um, that being recognized as so-called israelite ideology or nazi ideology is public relations it's propaganda mm -hmm. guys and if you cannot think critically with the internal uh, makeup and intelligence that has been inculcated in you naturally which cannot mm -hmm. be edited by propagandists then what you need to uh, we need to recognize that's the place you have to look at first the proverbial kingdom within and I mean this is all stuff that we touched on and then just to yes. complement that quickly um, 
specifically for Christian Zionists, right? Because they believe in the New Testament. This was written in the Old Testament or the Tanakh or the Torah, okay? In the so-called, in the New Testament, then God has a totally different attitude. Like, you know, you must love thy neighbor and, you know, um, you turn the other cheek and so on. Now, as it says in, in the Bible, a, a thousand years is like a day to God. So if God changes his mind from the Old Testament to the New Testament, that's like being bipolar because it's changing <laughs> your attitude totally from one day to the next. It's just, it's silly, okay? It's very, yeah. very silly. So that's the first point of contention that needs to be um, be aggressively addressed because it's it's ridiculous. It's no different than Nazi propaganda, guys. And if you can't deduce something so obvious, then you need to recognize, you know, there was a... Uh, a guy by the name of Ernest Holmes and he had a totally different interpretation of the Bible very interesting to check out but he had a great quote where he said that uh, we are bound by nothing except belief we are bound by nothing except belief which coincides with you know with Bob Marley was paraphrasing Marcus Garvey and he said emancipate yourself from mental slavery none but ourselves free our minds and part of really emancipating yourself mentally because that's the first step to any kind of freedom right without yeah. mental freedom there is no such thing as freedom we have to be willing to challenge our core beliefs as potentially being wrong and as being potentially inserted there by deceptive and shadowy forces because if you look around boys and girls the world <laughs> in which we live it's the agents of deception that are in power and that which is popular that which is most easily found such as the most mm. popular book in the world the bible which you know this was tabulated like i explained in the previous podcast by the roman empire under mm. constantine the great who killed his own son and he killed his own wife and he practiced all these pagan things i mean there's so, so so much of christianity today is really just paganism dressed up mm. as christianity um, <laughs> but we have what we have to question like could the whole story that we've been told, and I know this is very daunting, especially for people that have built the foundation of the identity on these things, yeah. because then it puts you in a position where you feel lost. And I get that. I'm not trying to strip that away from you. I'm not trying to take it away from you. I'm not trying to throw out the baby with the proverbial bed um, bath water. Bathwater, water, right? yeah. I'm not trying to do that. You can still uh, maintain the greater tenets that assimilate and that resonate with you morally without that's right you know without succumbing to the something that is obviously so depraved and so irrational and so inhumane yeah a and liberation is the key word you know i mean i just i it's really hard for me to subscribe and put any kind of stock because i don't see i, I just see i just see religion being part of the problem in this world I, I, there's been very little benefit um from the uh, from this you know I, I i always like to you know i like to kind of go far out with my perspective gavin i i, I think about it and and you know when i kind of intuitively feel into this notion of religion i feel like it is an earth problem you know what i'm saying like i feel like if you went to another planet where there was humanoids like us and and they were doing their thing and you were like so what's your guys religion they'd be like what's a religion I'm like well don't you um what is well, like look, your, it, your it concept depends. of god you know and they would be right. like you mean like the the creator that made us and is us <laughs> i feel like it would be like they would be confused and like so i'm gonna get into a fight with you because you have a different idea of of who and what the creator is i like it would be it would be a crazy concept i don't know it's just a thought i often often have uh, look, look a very simple analogy that i thought about one day i was sitting there and i thought you know what's a good way to contextualize this that people can understand in a short and concise manner the way i would describe it is it's similar to plato's allegory of the cave but, but different and what i mean by that is imagine that you are in a dungeon it's it's dark you cannot see anything and then you see a little candlelight and so naturally you gravitate towards this candlelight because it allows you to see a bit more of what's going on in this dungeon yeah but now if you don't use that candlelight to guide you to a greatest form of light 
to guide you out of that dungeon no matter what yes you've got a little light now but you're still stuck in the dungeon to me that's analogous to religion so yeah. oftentimes people will be in such a blinding darkness and th this you know for anybody that's been to jail you know that people are intensely religious there and it actually gives them some kind of solace hmm. because it's they're in such a dark place that they need something right the storm is raging you need to hold on to something even now with this woke ideology and all this crazy shit for a lot of people that's the only form of candlelight they have in the darkness and so they cling to this yeah. however people need not confuse the small candlelight with something far brighter that illuminates on a much greater level and that's also in relation to the concept of enlightenment but the tricky part is enlightenment is an eternal journey right to come into your alignment with the truth which represents all the knowledge that we have gained as a total society throughout so-called civilization including the knowledge that has been suppressed and then all the knowledge we still have to gain so in other words it's potentially infinite we don't even know how far it goes it's like the yeah, ocean yeah. nobody's been to the bottom of the ocean so whoever is listening to this um sure use you know i'm a proponent of people abiding by religion if it affords them the opportunity as a stepping stone to continue their personal growth in this world and be a better human being yeah but as the saying goes if you um, need religion to engage in kindness if you need some kind of motive like oh i'm going to get to heaven if i do good things <laughs> the problem is that you a bit of a, a shitty person like you not just you know people i don't believe are innately shitty people no. but you need to get in touch with who you are on a deeper level man you know yeah um but I, I don't want to i don't want to snatch that away from people like we're living in crazy times you know where people are fucking just saturated people are like repent jesus is coming i'm like um oh. you yeah, know that's that's when it starts to get uh, excessive listen, I and, 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 and that's been and, and that right there has been an endless theme <laughs> throughout history and it's always been capitalized upon by the parasite yeah. class you know mm -hmm. repent jesus i can't i can't wait for jesus to come i'm like um i think jesus was already here i mean i hope you're right i hope he does come but i wouldn't like skip lunch and wait for him i would just kind of carry on with what you're doing you, you um, know for because... me, for me <laughs> yeah for me it's like this man let's say that that is something that's going to really happen why not just do the best you can so that either way you're doing the best that you can you know what i mean it's just it's it's a very but, strange thing to me like to to wait around i mean there's dude, also a proverb a, if it, i if i recall correctly in the bible about not about waiting around is is something that's frowned upon by jesus and by the uh and, and by it, the prophets it's, i don't know i mean maybe i'm crazy <laughs> but it's just so fucking immature to me it's so it's such a fool-hearted notion this notion of of of, of it's so try and like this is a problem like we, i think that we need to spiritually evolve as a people and understand that punishment doesn't come in the afterlife and it, and in, in a great in a, in a in a very real way it doesn't serve us in this life there are consequences to actions and those consequences can sometimes feel like punishments and yeah and if you're living we do in live consciously, in a, yeah, yeah uh, and, and we do so and people will suffer from them but like this notion that, you know, they're going to burn in hell and it, it, dude, you know what I mean? Like th that's not helping anything. You know, I, I, I understand the sentiment 100%. And, and I do feel like that, there are people, you know, yeah. yeah. And, and, but go, and but, stuff like stuff like that can't even be answered, man. You know what I mean? Like, no, I know. We, I know. we don't know. So for, for <laughs> me, it's very simple, right? Like this is kind of the debate between choice and fate like are yeah. you guiding your life through choice or is there fate i think that it could potentially be a bit of both however because the only thing within my control is my decisions i need to take ownership of that fully and wholly and i need to assume for the purpose of being as productive as i possibly can that that is really the primary influence not just in my personal life but in society at large 
And so that yeah. not only results in personal subjective responsibility, but in a responsibility of how you imprint on this world, on this reality, on this planet and so on. And then also exactly. collectively. Yeah. And, and, and this is what blows me away. Kat. People are like, um, you, every baby killed, every Palestine baby killed is Hamas's fault. It, every person who died, like, like, and I even saw like this, this quote saying that we'll never forgive them. It was from a, an, an Israeli official. We'll never forgive them for making us kill their babies. I mean, this was oh, a quote. Oh, goodness. And, 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 and I'm just like, do you, do you hear, do you hear yourselves? Yeah. Like, but you like see, this, this, that, this thinking is insane. You know, it's, this is that, yeah, fucking... it's completely insane. But it also appeals to people who unfortunately are blinded by the darkness of ignorance which is to say they don't recognize yeah. and understand that there's a level of sophistication in warfare today where you can target a <laughs> specific Dude. individual with such precision Liam. yeah with such precision and I'm, not, and I'm not even talking about through um, conventional tactics you can even do it biologically where you yeah. can wipe out people specifically and i can guarantee you they'll get they'll easily get biological profiles on this it's just it's nonsense because it's you know what nonsense. you know what we should do we should Dangerous. climb into this man because then what yeah, i can let's do, do it. is i can actually yeah. illuminate the ideology behind why the state of israel Please. acts like that and then once we get into that people are going to have an aha moment and they're going to say well there you go it's they've had a policy <laughs> since the earliest immigrants uh landed there the earliest radical immigrants landed there from the russian empire that they were going to take the land by force and they've had this idea of it's, today it's commonly called greater israel but it's actually rooted in something called revisionist zionism which is land maximalism right they want to have a very large tract of land and so what you're seeing is the natural result of that because the ethos of the current lehud party is dominated mm. by revisionist zionism so when when people get that they're going to realize okay this isn't about the religion of biblical accounts this is actually about the religion of ideology the religion of revisionist zionism specifically so we'll, we'll get into all of this man and there's there's so many there's a diversity of influences involved here that actually ties into the much larger construct of global governance this isn't just about the state of israel this is no. about global governance i mean for, for those of us who have an understanding of this blueprint and this signature this is very apparent you know watching events this screams of global governance and this screams of this agenda that is happening and why this war popped off and you know, oh, wait till wait till we get into things guys and you, you're gonna it's gonna become it. it's gonna become very very clear how this is uh, israel the state of israel is simply an instrumental weapon in mm. the bag of tricks of the parasite class on the global level yeah so take us into the weeds brother let's like track this yeah. for us you know where 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 should we 100%. start because and no, no, what we'll do know. is we'll actually start with british christian zionism okay so lord shaftesbury he was one of the first that put forward the idea of resettling the jews in at the time what was the turkish empire and as you can see uh, he outlined this in the quarterly review it was written in 1839 so this was a long time ago hmm. and um, i looked up this specific publication which is why i put over there page 105 for anybody that wants to fact check even though this is a credential the historian i like to still fact check things it's good to do that hmm. and so you can see over here he spoke about uh the growth of the produce so the food over there he spoke about the finest cotton may be obtained in almost unlimited abundance silk and matter and olive oil and so he said that this would be a good place geostrategically and the significance for mentioning this is that yeah we have already in the in the early 1800s a christian zionist a politician who's mm. talking about resettling the jews in a specific piece of land and really using them more so as kind of a buffer just kind of as a 
as a tributary, as a, as a vassal state. And he, this guy, what also makes him so significant, for those who have heard about the this quote, a land with people, for a people without land, which is one of the mythologies. It's never been right. true, but it sounds really cool. He was the one that actually invented that, so he was the originator of that. that this guy did that? Wow. Yeah, Lord Shaftesbury. Okay, then yeah. a, the, a second dude, and this was at the same time, as this guy around the same time this guy over here charles henry churchill he was actually winston churchill's ancestor mm, he was, he was winston sense, the churchill yeah. family is actually very prominent in britain which i didn't know about this until recently but the churchill family has been very prominent historically it's one of the yeah. powerful families there and so he came up with an idea for a plan to create a Zionist state in the region of Palestine. And he specifically did this, again, for geostrategic reasons. So if you look at this publication he wrote, it's called Mount Lebanon. And this was, again, during the 1800s, the mid-1800s. Mm -hmm. And you see in the bottom over there, this is in the preface, he says, it must, for obvious reasons, be clear to every English mind that if England's oriental supremacy is to be upheld, Syria and Egypt must be made to fall more or less under her sway of influence. Now, the significance here is in the past, Palestine was part of Syria. So he's talking about the region of Palestine as well. Hmm. So that's very significant, right? Once again, he's talking yeah. about geopolitics. And a good summary of this was put together here in a publication called Imperial Perceptions of Palestine. This is page 189. And this was written by Professor Lorenzo Camille. It's always good to know your sources. I like to compare sources mm -hmm. in relation to where you're getting your knowledge, your information, and your facts from in the same way that it's relevant and pertinent to where is, are you getting your food from? Are you getting organic good produce? Are you getting it mm -hmm. from a local farmer? Is it processed? Is it bullshit? So you need to know your sources. And Professor Lorenzo Camille, he's recognized internationally as a credential authority, he's award-winning and so on. So it's a, it's a safe source is what I'm saying to cite, um, not a controversial guy. And he makes a nice little summary here. So first he, he mentions what I pointed out there from the publication Mount Lebanon. And then he <clears> says, Churchill identified two conditions for the success of that plan. One is that <clears throat> Jews had to lead the project. So this gives a good cover is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Two European powers had to back it. And two mm -hmm. European powers had to back it. Okay, and then part of it, he also started to correspond, you see, uh, 18th June, 1841, with a guy by the name of Sir Moses Montefiore. And part of that correspondence, he says at the very end, you can see we have highlighted it, that Syria and Palestine, in a word, must be taken under European protection. Protection. So yes, yeah, <laughs> so this is Sir Moses Montefiore. Very, very influential Jewish figure and somebody I just recently actually became aware of as being the founder of the first settlement, the first Jewish settlement. So Rishon LeZion, which we covered in the previous interview, mm -hmm. that is recognized officially as being the first settlement founded by the Jews and this was by Baron Edmund de Rothschild through his patronage. But what isn't spoken about is the fact that prior to him there was actually this guy Sir Moses Montefiore and he found this settlement over here. And the interesting thing about this is look at the date, 1860. So this happened mm -hmm. after the correspondence he had with um, with Churchill, right? With Charles Henry Churchill. That's very significant. So he yeah. had the correspondence, you can see over here, this was 1841, they started talking about it. And then by 1860, eventually, after pouring some cash into there, after working the plans out, obviously, they founded the first colony. So, so let me ask you a question, Kevin. Yeah, hold on, sure. hold on. Hold, okay. hold. Yeah, now so, I'm going to stop sharing it. Let me get out of here real quick. Okay, so shoot. How... Okay, so let me just ask you this. Where was Israel the, the place mm. in the year 1800? No, it was obviously non-existent. It did not it wasn't exist. in existence, right? Where was Israel in 1500? Yeah, it did not exist, 100%. It didn't exist, right? What about the year 1000? Yeah, still not a brother. So so how the fuck? I don't understand how people... I mean, I, I see this, all people are like... People believe that Palestine never existed. 
And I'm like, what are you, what, like, I don't even know what to say to these people. I'm, I, they're so confused. So, so I have heard this argument, and what I would say to that, it's very easy to dismiss for somebody who has some insight, is every single country that you recognize today, the borders, the names, even nationalities, none of that existed. These are all constructs that were created at one time or another. So right. this, this argument is superfluous. It, it amounts to nothing. It's like saying, yeah. oh, Europe never existed. Right. Earth never existed. You're right. Earth didn't <laughs> exist because it didn't have a yeah. name. It, it wasn't recognized by a name. Palestinian, uh, that region historically, um, yes, it's, it's existed. And the people that were there, and we're going to get into this. I mean, we're going to go into information because these are more surface level debates. We're going to go into shit much yeah. deeper. But um, Palestine and the people there, the, the ultimate significance is that the people that were there had been there for centuries. Okay tilling the land they had very different land laws different land laws which we can get into as well and unlike the propaganda we've been told we owe these innocent jews that were being uh, oppressed and there was certainly an element of that but the most um influential were radical and some of them were literally terrorists and from the beginning from the moment they landed there it was very unambiguous where they made it resoundingly clear that their plan was to go ahead and at this time there were a small minority less than 10 percent of the population that they were going to become the majority they were going to get rid of the of the arab majority they make this very clear we can we're going to get into the details i'm going to show the publications that they're going to get rid of this arab majority and they are going to likely have to do so through force so what Mm. what's going to happen there imagine uh, for specifically because one of the strongest demographics that support this as a result of being indoctrinated, which is yeah. in the United States. Imagine now you have Chinese and Russian billionaires that show up in the United States and they start writing openly, their intellectuals start writing openly about how they are going to oust the majority American population with right. the Chinese, exactly, with the Chinese and Russian population. How would people feel about that? <laughs> They wouldn't feel very yeah. good. They, they would eventually take no. up armed resistance. And that's just, uh, of course, a very oversimplified version. There's a lot more in it. And it all starts to make sense when you actually have the details before you. And we'll get into that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so where were we? Let's, let's, let's proceed. Okay. We were... All right. 100%. Uh, Let me just see if I can get this right Churchill, again. Yeah. 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 Okay, just give me a moment, your entire screen. Because I, I you know, screen. people don't understand that there is a through line. There's a genealogy, for lack of a better word. You know, there's a there's a, a, a lineage, a family tree. You know, a, a, a relationship between eugenics, Nazism. Are you gonna find, are we're going to go through you know, all of that shit, man. It's going, all of it is going to converge in such a profound way that people who have been interested in this topic are going to just... For me as a researcher, it's been one of the most interesting things I have ever researched, probably also because I have the vantage point of having quite a, a, a strong understanding of the history of global governance. And now for me to see how the state of Israel fits into that equation and their relationship with the Nazis and how it has served for geopolitical purposes, all of that coming full circle, man, it is so, so fascinating. But, but let's move forward and, um, yeah. and we'll get into it, man, because there's so much to get into. I don't okay. know if we're going to be able to do it all in this podcast. I'm actually going to probably end up teaching, um, well, let me just say I am. I'm going to teach a master class on this and how it relates to global government and shadow nice. government at large. Yeah. Okay. So, nice, bro. Yeah, man, it, it has to be done. You know, we at a point now in history. Okay, so there's uh, Sir Moses Montefiore. That's where we, we were lost. Now, Sir Moses Montefiore was related to none other than Nathan Mayer Rothschild. He was his brother-in-law. They both married into a prom- another prominent Jewish family called the Cohen family. Now, the significance of Nathan, uh, Nathan Mayer Rothschild. Now, this dude was the big boy. He was one of the five sons of Mayer mm-hmm. Amschel Rothschild. But he was really, in many ways, you can consider him to be the head honcho dude, right? He it was under his patronage. As you can see, I got this. This is directly from the Rothschilds archive. People can go look this up for themselves. Where 
they rescued the Bank of England. You see, in late 1825, the Rothschilds averted a financial crisis by supplying a large volume of gold to the Bank of England when the bank ran desperately short of coin gold. And then also the Waterloo Commission, which preceded that, um, for the British government, they helped to basically fund and supply Wellington's army. And they did this on multiple occasions. They also did this in the Crimea War. And then they right. also did this in, uh, in World War II. So why am I pointing this out specifically about Nathan Mayer Rothschild? So uh, again, I'll refer people to the previous podcast we've done where we spoke and we detailed the Rothschild's influence in the foundation of the state of Israel. But more significantly, because what I'm exploring first before we move forward into the radicalism from in the Russian Empire, the, the, what was the fanatical um, radicalism that was dominating that population and then the Jewish immigrants that came out of that and how they brought that ideology with them. The first thing we're actually going to address here is the hidden hand of the British Empire in the establishment yeah. of Israel. And the first thing I want to just establish here is how the Rothschild family and the British royals have been partners for literally two centuries. So you cannot speak about one without the other. Their decisions are right. very closely connected, is my point. So over here, this guy, Baron Lionel de Rothschild. Okay, this was mm. the son of the aforementioned Nathan Mayer Rothschild. And he was the first Jewish member of parliament in the city of London. And this is when the relationship of directly advising the royal family also begins. So you see in 1852, uh, the Rothschild family, under the leadership of Baron Lionel de Rothschild, excuse me, they advised Queen Victoria and Prince Albert on a number of things, and they, you know, give them loans. I encourage people to go check out the Rothschild's archive. Although, you mm -hmm. know, it's really interesting. Remember the first two podcasts we did, and I went through some of the Rothschild's archives info? Yeah. You know that some of that stuff has now been hidden behind a, um, a security paywall. paywall. Uh, yeah, yeah. No mind blowing. But but anybody Shocker. that runs into that, yeah. But anybody that does run into that, check out archive.org because it's likely that the pages were archived. And if I visited them, then I probably archived it myself. And nice. then you see over here in 1852, they're advising the queen and then the prince. And then also the establishment of the Royal Mint Finery in 1852, which would be uh, serve their the war efforts. And this is the big one as it relates to Palestine. And we addressed this again in a previous podcast where they helped them purchase the Suez Canal. And the Suez Canal, mm -hmm. um, just to give a quick summation, so for people that are listening to this for the first time, if you do find this podcast interesting, which I'm sure you will if you go through the whole thing, go to one of the previous ones. Because what the Suez Canal represented was a pivotal um, global route to control trade. In fact, it was the pivotal route. So if you could control that, then you were capable of controlling basically international trade. And that's why the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad, which was being built between the German Empire and the Turkish Empire, that was uh, basically a direct threat to the Suez Canal and is now recognized and studied by historians as being one of the primary, if not the primary reason for the First World War. So again, this That's is just right. to illustrate the relationship between the Rothschilds and the British royals and how close it was. And this has gone all the way up until the modern day. So we see Evelyn de Rothschild, he recently passed away and mm -hmm. he was a direct advisor to the Queen. And I'm sure this relationship probably still goes on in some kind of capacity. But uh, oh, yeah. uh, I haven't, you know, there's so many things going on. But as you can see, for two centuries, literally, the Rothschild family and the royal in the royals in uh, in Britain and actually beyond Britain, the royals all throughout yeah. Europe have worked with the Rothschilds on one level or another. And this then takes us to his son. So Baron Lionel the Rothschild's eldest son was this guy over here. His name was also... Um, Nathan Mayer Rothschild, but he was the second one. Because obviously this one mm -hmm. over here was the first one. I know it's a bit confusing, right. guys, so just stick with me. Don't get too hung up on the names. Doesn't help that they're all fucking inbred either. Exactly, hundred <laughs> percent, yes. And and they literally did. Those dudes married their cousins and Oh yeah, and so tell, and so they they say it right, you know, they'll tell you themselves. Yeah. To keep so, it in So where this gets significant now, right, is Lord Rothschild, that's we'll refer to him in that context because it's easier to remember. He was connected to this guy Cecil Rhodes, and he Cecil Rhodes was engaged in the British South Africa Company, 
which colonized South Africa and actually played a role in apartheid before apartheid existed. It laid down the groundwork for that. People don't know about that. And the De Beers Company, which was also actually instrumental in laying down the uh, blueprint for apartheid. Now, he, Lord Rothschild, helped to finance Cecil Rhodes in these two particular organizations. But more specifically, Cecil Rhodes had this idea, okay, of, and let me stop it, and we'll go back to it. Let me talk about it first a little bit. Okay, Cecil Rhodes had this idea, right, of literally creating a secret society to further the British establishment's power in a clandestine way. And they wanted to actually reabsorb the United States. And there was a eugenics element behind this, where he wanted to proliferate the Anglo-Saxon race in specific and in particular. Now, bear in mind, this is, I don't know, 67 years um, long before Hitler came along. Okay, It's almost like yeah. a full century before the Nazi policies are being implemented. And so he had this concept and this idea that he wanted to engage in. And uh, one of the ways he was going to do this, let me go ahead and get that share screen, was through something called the Rhodes Trust. Now, some people may have heard of Rhodes Scholars, right? Scholar, the prestigious, yeah. yeah, the prestigious Rhodes, Rhodes Scholarship. That's actually, that comes from Cecil Rhodes and specifically the Rhodes Trust. So you can see at the bottom of here, uh, I have a, a picture of the, this very eerie symbolism of this owl. It looks like something wow. from Bohemian Grove. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. they, they've got very interesting symbols, man, when you start to study them very closely in the esoteric and occult meanings but this is where things start to get quite interesting okay uh, you start to see a really shadowy influence um, in all of this so the Rhodes Trust was established for this purpose and now just to go with some specific quotes and anybody can look this up um, this is not anything controversial it is incontrovertible you can look up his um, his dying wills okay Wow. And uh, and Lord Rothschild was actually entrusted as a trustee to execute the Rhodes Scholarship and the Rhodes Trust. That's the significance. Yeah, that's the connection. And you can see. I, oh, yeah, I, here. Let me read this. I, Go ahead. I contend that we are the finest race in the world and that the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race. Just fancy those parts that are at present inhabited by the most despicable specimens of human beings. What an alteration there would be if they were brought under Anglo-Saxon influence. Look again at the extra employment a new country added to our dominion gives. I contend that every acre added to our territory means in the future birth to some more of the English race, and then it cuts off a little bit, um, be brought into existence. So th this is <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, this is just racism, an excerpt. Oh yeah, that, you know, so that, that clearly, yeah, clearly underscores a major consideration of eugenics. But now look at the second part to this, right? I'm going to let you go ahead and read that as well, just okay. to give a different narration idea, in all of this. Okay, <clears throat> the idea gleaming and dancing before one's eyes like a will of the wisp at last frames itself into plan. Why should we not form a secret society with but one object, the furtherance of the British Empire and the bringing of the whole uncivilized world under British rule for the recovery of the United States for the making, for, for the, making the Anglo Saxon race but one empire? What a dream, but yet it is probable, it is possible. There's yep. your plan, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, you know, yeah, and it's gonna, get, it's gonna get crazier. It's going to get crazier. So let me just take a moment to pause there and stop. And then we can uh, we can talk about that a little bit further. Okay. I mean, you, you see you see the the foreshadow there of, of, of every ethno genocide that has happened since then. You can look at what they did in Africa. Look at what look at the structures they created. Look at what they've done. Look, I mean, how can you not see that that Nazi Germany literally took a page from from this you know well i mean well, look, people it's, think it's, it's it's definitely all connected man but, but we're gonna get into it we're gonna lay down the details because it just it snowballs from there so yeah one of the outgrowths of this road scholarship was something called the round table movement okay the round table movement was a think tank 
and the round table movement part of their task was to carry out kind of Rhodes ideas right and, and there were several mm. specific individuals that were involved in this now one of the ways we know about this was actually from a guy by the name of Carol Quigley professor Carol Quigley who I'm sure you've heard it at some point yeah almost everybody has right because this dude is such a strong source because he's so well credentialed and um he he's such an upstanding authority that you can turn people towards um but let's go ahead and there it is so this is his publication tragedy no hope and just to get to preface it real quick with the following for those who aren't familiar with professor carol quigley the guy taught at uh, harvard university he taught at the ivy league schools he taught at georgetown university and he's course was repeatedly mentioned by all of these like elite politicians as being their favorite. He was highly awarded, highly recognized. Bill Clinton in fact mm. named him as one of his primary influences. And so he wrote this publication called Tragedy and Hope. Um and the reason why I mention all of that is so you know that this is an establishment historian. He generally was I mean genuinely yeah. was an establishment historian, which is always best if you can use their own sources, right? And yeah, you see on page 950 where he explains that there does exist and has existed for a generation an international anglophile network which operates to some extent in the way the radical right believes the communists act. In fact, this network, which we may identify as the round table groups, has no aversion to cooperating with the communists or any other groups and frequently does so. I know of the operations of this network because I have studied it for 20 years and was permitted for 2 years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. Then just to wow. add over here very quickly before we move forward, he explains that I have no aversion to it or to most of its aims and have for much of my life been very close to it and to many of its instruments. The only thing that he really objected to was that they wanted to keep it secret. He wanted to share this history, not realizing mm. <laughs> um and maybe this was a tactic of his, I don't know, but uh this will naturally, you know, cause some kind of public outrage. Now, one of the things that he spoke about is how this group, this is page 144 of Tragedy and Hope, which is a very difficult read <laughs> for anybody out there yeah. that may be interested. It's a difficult read, man. It's like reading the Bible, and I've read the whole Bible on a on numerous mm. occasions. Yeah. Where he writes over here he says but there's some really explosive information every now and then. We explains one of the things that this round table group was working on and remember the stated goal of Rhodes Will was the extension of the British Empire through a secret society and through covert means. One of the things that they were working on is how they could change the British Empire into the so-called Commonwealth of Nations. Okay, they were instrumental behind this. And you can even see this now if you go look up on Wikipedia, which were it this shocked me when I looked it up because in the past it was very difficult beyond the guidance provided by Professor Carol Quigley to corroborate this. But you can see in their journal, which it clearly outlines and you can read the journal as well, um which was established in 1910, it was about the Commonwealth of Nations and it explains it. And this is where it gets very very interesting. is that the commonwealth dates back to the first half of the 20th century with the decolonization of the british empire through increased self-governance of its territory so just very quickly to comment on that what people need to recognize is throughout history there has been a reciprocal dance so to speak between the parasite class and humanity okay between the humans of this planet that simply want to live in freedom and be left the hell alone and have mm-hmm. introductory human principles such as just simple decency and those who mean to exploit and create and create chaos so naturally as things evolve the parasite class being as insidious and skillful as they are they adapt their strategies so what they are talking about here is that during that time there was a massive movement for decolonization where people were agitating for independence and when one domino falls boys and girls dominoes start right. falling all around the world and that's exactly what we are even living through today as a result of the information revolution through the internet now as you see uh, moving forward 
he explains that the Commonwealth was originally created as the British Commonwealth of Nations through the Balfour Declaration. Wow. Right? Very, very, very interesting, man. Very, very interesting. Okay. Let's stop that there. All right. So let's talk about that a bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> So the Balfour Declaration, we have recognized this as just personifying what took place in Palestine. And again, I'll refer people to kind of get into the yeah. weeds of all of that because, you know, first they promised the land to the Arabs through the McMahon Hussein correspondence, then they promised they the land to the Zionist yeah. Yeah, yeah, then they promised the land to the Zionist Jews through the Balfour Declaration. And so that's that's where the most visible conflict stems today and rightfully so because it was duplicitous it was very underhanded right but what we aren't told about and i only recently became aware of this is that the balfour declaration wasn't just between uh lord rothschild and um and arthur balfour which we know about right there right. were two other highly significant authors involved in that which was leo a guy by the name of leo amory and Alfred Milner. In fact, Leo Amory is now recognized. Him and Alfred Milner are recognized as the true authors behind the Balfour Declaration. What's the significance of this? The significance in all of this, and I'm going to see if I can just pull up uh, Leo Amory's picture to give people a visual. The significance in all of this is Leo Amory and Alfred Milner were both as well as Lord Rothschild. They were trustees of Cecil mm. Rhodes' will. They were very close to him. In fact, Leo Amory was the longest standing trustee of Rhodes' will that they had. Let me just share a visual. It's always nice to give people visuals because it helps to reinforce in relation to memory what we are dealing with, right? Right. Okay, let's just get this up here. Yeah, my apologies. Uh, let's go with a window. Can you do that again? Oh, you got too much stuff going on here, brother. Okay, no. Yes. All right, can you see that? Yes. Okay. There's a little visual for people. This is Leo Amory over over there. All right. Nice to have a visual. Helps to reinforce it in your mind. What is also significant about Leo Amory is Leo Amory helped to establish something called the Jewish Legion. And he did this alongside a guy by the name of Vladimir Zehev Jabotinsky. Okay. Let's pull up old Vladimir Zehev Jabotinsky because this dude is the most commemorated figure. In Israeli history. No and, shit. Yep, and it's his ideology. Savage. <laughs> uh, oh, my brother, wait till we get I to guess, that, my dude. My intuition tells me he's a real savage. Uh, if that's yeah, it. You, you can just see in this in this photo. I mean, a photo's worth Look a thousand words. Oh, he's a character. We're going to get into that. Okay, we are going to get into that. All right. Let me stop this for a moment. Let's talk about this. Okay. So the Round Table Group, what made them so significant, right? is during this period they were in process of um, countering the movement for independence that was going on globally, decolonization globally. So this period, as it starts to progress, it coincides with the agitation for independence in, let's say, Ireland, the agitation for independence in I India, and in all kinds of British Egypt too, countries. I think, right? right? I oh, mean, was, a lot in of the people East, were like... In, in the Middle East, it was everywhere. Kevin. Excuse me. Because yeah, fucking no. Brit Britain had a stronghold on so many places. But once their banks are in place and they got their corporations set up, you know, the, I mean, people are like... And that's oh, exactly okay, how they right? did it, man. That's yep. all they needed. You yeah, know? So, so that's exactly... We're going to get into that right there. Boom. What they basically did is... Remember, the Round Table movement was a think tank. They needed to come up with how can we control these people and give them the illusion of independence, right? It's kind of like politics. Give, yeah. give the plebs the illusion of choice, but we still yeah. going to control shit at the end of the day. Like, oh, yeah, Democrat, Republican, left wing, right wing. But when it comes control to the, the really serious plan. shit, we are going to agree at the highest levels. And yeah. they always want to provide you with the illusion of choice because they learned a long, long time ago. In fact, if you go back to the ancient Roman Empire, they started doing this way back then already. They learned a long, long time ago that the easiest way to control people is what you yeah. need to do is you have to give them the illusion of choice. Sorry, let me just put this a little bit down. All right. Okay. So we're going to actually, we'll, we'll lead up into this gradually because it all starts to converge and it all starts to coincide. 
okay it all starts to come together on how these forces have worked together now so I wanted to lay that foundation down that we have this shadowy hand here. we have this round table group that is working on how can they control different parts of the globe which is going to also comprise Palestine how can mm -hmm. they control these different parts of the globe? They wanted the with, U.S. back too. With, with, yeah. Without being on the surface, well, look, take a look at the Pilgrim Society. Take a look at the relationships in World War One and World War Two, and how the British establishment brought the U.S. in as its uh, pit bull, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the Pilgrim Society again. Check that out. Really good. But what, what's so crazy about this is it, it goes beyond that because we can also start to see the, the overlap in the relationship and the working with Nazi Germany. <laughs> <laughs> it's one big club like George Collins said and you ain't in yeah. it alright it's them against us that's what it comes down to yeah okay so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put that on, on, on the shelf for a moment we're gonna come back to it and we're gonna start to get into the radicals that came out of the Russian Empire which included the guy that I just showed and mentioned Vladimir Zahev Jabotinsky okay mm -hmm. now we aren't told about this right we told the, the kind of account for people that have even been halfway down the rabbit hole. We are told that basically the Jews that immigrated to Palestine, they moved there as a result of vicious pogroms. Right? That's what we get told. Yeah. And, and there is truth to this, undeniably. But you know what we are not told about? Is that these pogroms resulted because there was terrorism going on in the Russian Empire. Uh, by an organization called Narodnaya Voya, and I'm probably butchering that, but translated into English, it means the people's will. All right, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share the screen on this one so people can see what I'm talking about. Okay, boom, there you go. Narodnaya Voya, the people's will. And this was a literal terrorist organization. They actually spoke openly about how they utilized terrorism. And they were uh, a split from an earlier organization called Land and Liberty, which you can see over here. When I do that, can you see the highlight? Oh, uh, I, I can see where you highlight it, but I can't see that. I can't read it. It's too small. Okay, wait there. I'm making it a bit bigger. There you go. Is that a bit better? That's a little better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. All right. Land and Liberty. Now, the significance of this specifically... And while I'm talking about this, let me go ahead. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Is that if you look at the academic publications regarding the specific topic, is some of the executive leadership of these groups. Now, th th this was a very powerful group, man. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm busy working on a blog that's also going to tabulate everything for people that maybe, you know, get a bit lost in translation. Yeah. This group was behind the assassination of high-ranking political figures. High-ranking political figures. So they yeah. were recognized as a very subversive and dangerous force. One of the significant factors in all of this is that a lot of the executive leadership was made up of prominent Jews. Now, it was a diverse organization. The minority was Jews. It wasn't even a majority. But nonetheless, this was on people's radars. And also the yeah. Russian Empire previously had been in the Crimea War. In the Crimea War, they were up against the British establishment and other powers, and the Rothschilds financed the British establishment. So likely these things were on their minds. It was also a very popular publication, I can't recall yeah. what it was named now, from a Jew that had converted to uh, Christianity, because you know this was Russia back then was Christian Orthodox. And right. so there was a suspicion, you know, oh, the Jews. Like, that's also been right. a real thing historically, man. Oh, the Jews right. are going to come get us, you know. Merchant of Venice. Yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah we spoke. Yeah, you go, 100%. Yeah. We spoke about that before. And it's just as ridiculous as the Muslims are going to come get us, you know. It's all just right. tribalistic, stupid bullshit. But nonetheless, within the executive leadership, there existed a strong Jewish presence. Now, I want to make this very clear to everybody to understand. During this period... One of the things that they were deeply concerned about in the Russian Empire is the nihilism. Nihilism is essentially the belief that life has no purpose. It's non-religious. It's, yeah. it's, it's atheistic. This they viewed as a serious threat to the, the governing structure, which was Orthodox Christianity. And so the Jews then were, this is the ethnic 
uh, composition of a Jew, right? Which is diversity within the ethnicity of being a Jew as well. There's Sephardic mm-hmm. Jews, there's Ashkenazi Jews, and then there's um, Misraic Jews. But there were these nihilistic Jews such as Karl Marx, right? And I mean, uh, he was just somebody who spoke about the opium of the masses. So the ideology that was yeah. dumb and the opium of the masses was religion. And so this ethos, this ideology was dominating the population. And this organization, the People's Will, carried out high profile assassinations, right? Until eventually they murdered none other than Tsar Alexander II mm. of Russia. No, and guess what then, happened wasn't? after his assassination? So his assassination was in 1881, right? That's when the pogroms came in the aftermath. So you can click on the aftermath for Jews. So he was seen as tolerant for Jews, so on and so forth. But pogroms came, yeah, in the May laws. Boom. Okay, let's, there you go. And immediately they, after this, they instituted the May laws. So his son came into power, Alexander III. He... Um, became stringently targeted targeting against the jews they absorbed a lot of the blame for his assassination and what's very interesting is this assassination is recognized as the first suicide bombing attack in history now there were several people involved only one of them was a jew but nonetheless because of the executive leadership of this organization they were recognized as uh, as the predominant threat and so that's when these programs began right so let me stop it for a moment there, you know, we can discuss that. So yeah. as a result of this, Jews began to leave Russia. Now, very interesting that the May laws, let me also just actually put this here, and I'm sorry if I'm jumping around a bit. But at the time that these anti-Semitic May um, laws were being put into effect, the French branch of the Rothschild family were in fact giving loans to the Russian Empire, so you can see. Oh no shit! Wow. Oh yeah, hundred percent, brother. Might want to notice. <laughs> yeah. And this is specifically the French branch that were the ones that were instrumental in the founding of Israel. Yeah. So Baron Edmund de Rothschild, you see this company that's called Benito. Let's see if I can blow mm-hmm. this up a little bit. Yeah, Benito. Benito eventually uh, merged with Royal Dutch Shell. Royal Dutch Shell, boys and girls, oh, helped to familiar. finance. Oh, yeah, helped to finance and fund and provide oil to Nazi Germany, which we are eventually going to get into. Mm-hmm. But uh, despite the May laws, they went ahead and they gave a massive loan to Tsar Alexander III's regime. Which again shows they don't give a shit, guys. Okay, no, they this just is don't. A, this is create debt take control of the, of the assets you know i mean the more people in debt the more people you own it doesn't matter what side they're fucking on yeah 100 percent. The they, they, do best. they don't have an allegiance to that what's interesting yeah. though and i mean the early stages is uh, early stages of contemplating and cogently comprehending this but cecil rhodes entrusting who he clearly was you know he had these virulently racist views about spreading the anglo-saxon influence talk about worldwide. fucking white supremacy there's your fucking granddaddy right there <laughs> yeah you know but, I, but fucking... again it's important to recognize that he's specifically talking about anglo-saxons right yeah um and 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 the purity of anglo-saxons but then he he's having lord rothschild be who's a jew being his trustee so there seems to be this almost strange notion and it's just a possibility that the allegiance for uh, Lord Rothschild and others actually first and foremost is Anglo in its origins rather than Jewish yeah right uh, and I, I still subscribe to the belief that at the highest levels men because Cecil Rhodes I don't think he was one of the top dudes either I think at the highest no. levels they don't give a shit about any of that stuff they, they don't give a shit no you think they're you fucking at... wearing the yarmulkes and going to synagogue are you kidding me I don't give two fucks man. yeah and, and remember the house of Winslow used to be the house of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha they that's got right German, you know uh, that's right they, they're so shifty they just do whatever is going totally to get them shifty. to rule over people Yeah. and they use religion they use this this, especially a religion that composes both an ethnicity and a religion, boy, that's convenient. 
you know. I don't know. That's two, it that's just, two it, shields. You know? 100%, man. It just muddies the water. All right, so now what I want to do is we're going to get into some of the actual founding fathers of Israel. All right, like this is where we can start to expand on why is this state so fucking crazy? Yeah, because why do it, they have a proclivity for genocide? Yeah. Like, I mean, just anybody that has really studied and looked into the policies beyond the theatrics of this regime, why are they like that? Okay. Yeah. So let's start with David Ben-Gurion, who is considered the primary founder of Israel. David Ben-Gurion was, in fact, a radical Marxist. He was part of a group called Paul Zion. Paul Zion was instrumental in the communist revolution in Russia. And when he was younger, he used to actually frequently rob wealthier citizens. Then he <clears throat> immigrated in the wake of the pogroms. He immigrated to Palestine. And he was instrumental in something called Hebrew labor. And he was also a proponent of segregation, of segregating Arabs and Jews, which eventually just gradually started to manifest. Hebrew labor, for those who don't understand, what that is specifically is the concept that you only employ Jews. You do right. not employ Arabs. So one of the great points of contention that later came up with all these white papers and the advocacy for restricting Jewish immigration was that there were these underhanded land purchases taking place. And then once this large land was purchased all of the palestinians that worked it and we can get into like how the land ownership would work because it's not the the concept of ownership we have today in western society is a very new construct in the human story what they actually had back then was more communally owned lands so these people for generations had been working this land where i live now which is i mean i'm high up in the mountains very remote in the philippines i can <clears throat> i get a first um hand account of this because that's kind of how this culture operates they just right. oh, you know you've got this land i've got that land and it's been around for generations but eventually some slick politicians are going to come here and with the whisk of a pen they're going to be able to get a hold of that land unless right. th this really what happened in palestine in many ways that people don't recognize it wasn't about jews and muslims uh, that was nowhere near the, the reality of what was really going on the bigger thing was a clash of civilizations where you had mm. this Western imperialism and it knew the yeah. assignment from the beginning, which was mm. economical conquest, which was subjugation. And the Palestinian population was not at all prepared. And unfortunately, no. the leaders sold him out. Okay, so David Ben-Gurion is one of the elements and he's a guy that founded something called labor zionism the reality is labor zionism was radical marxism okay um, mm -hmm. except marxism is about class conflict they adopted the ideals of yeah. also having a jewish supremacy view right and he became the founding the primary founder of israel he was the first prime minister another guy was named Meir dizenhoff Mayor Dizenhoff was in fact a member of that terrorist group that I just mentioned, the People's Will. He was sent after he went to prison for several months as a result of him being a part of that group. He was then actually sent to Palestine on the patronage of Baron Edmund de Rothschild, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So you see the Rothschild's hand here again. And this guy eventually became the first mayor of Tel Aviv. So we have a guy that was literally involved with the terrorist organization. He's the first mayor of Tel Aviv. And when the Israeli Declaration of Independence was signed, it was signed at his home by Ben, <laughs> ben Gurion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. Um, another guy, and I suppose, let me just see if I can bring up some visuals. Yeah. Mayor. Say what you want about uh, America, but our founding fathers weren't fucking terrorists. They no, no, the, 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 these dudes were straight up something no, I know. else they man. were fucking killers you know yeah look it's it's wild man um i mean people can easily look up who david ben, -Gur ben gurion is he's one of the most famous figures involved so yeah. i suppose i don't have to um no he's he, i mean anybody with people specifically you know who, who he is a phone can look him up yeah 100 percent. but maya doesn't i can show people who that is because obviously even the way i'm pronouncing it if somebody wants to search the name they're going to be like what the hell is this dude yeah. even saying i'll spell it for everyone listening there you go okay so there, this dude he became the first 
um, mayor of Tel Aviv, which was also, by the way, is the first Jewish-only city in modern times. First Jewish-only city. And, and again, what year gonna, was this? When he, when he founded it, uh, I think it was founded in the early 1900s. So this was long before the official establishment right. of Israel. They already founded and this was the, long before Nazi Germany and the, and the quote, you know, the Jews need a protected place. So already, you know, even bef this is before they had the excuse of, you know, they're fleeing for safety and they needed a safe place. And this is the only safe place for Jews to live. But this, this is already happening right so uh, i just want to point that out oh yeah no 100 yeah. man 100 percent. and look another thing that is left out of this is that the overwhelming majority of jews including german jews did not want to go to palestine it no. was totally illogical for them okay totally illogical okay but so that's my disney right another guy is this guy yeah can you see that's pinhas rutenberg and i'm probably butchering his name it's on another podcast where the guy had a good chuckle he's a palestinian and he had a good chuckle by the way i said his name probably because it's all like penis <laughs> yeah P P penis rutenberg right that's how it sounds this dude was an actual assassin uh, he's recognized as being an assassin he was implicated in the assassination of a guy by the name of father george capon and you can see even in wikipedia it says he played an active role in two russian revolutions in 1905 and 1917 this guy found the Palestine Electric Corporation, which is currently the Israel Electric Corporation. Um, mm. And he actually did this with funding, again, from Baron Edmund de Rothschild. So we see the Rothschild's head again in all this. Very interesting, yeah. And he was also, he served as the president of the Jewish National Council. The Jewish National Council, for people who aren't familiar, this was the predecessor. So this actually served as the government before the official establishment of Israel. So they had their own little area, the yeshiv, the Jewish community, and he was the president. So this is a very influential figure, and he brought electricity to the region. This dude mm -hmm. was directly implicated in an assassination. Okay, and he was also, he ran in these radical terrorist circles. Um, and then another one, right? Yitzhak Ben Zvi. Yitzhak Ben Zvi was the second and longest standing president. He was also a radical Marxist. He w worked very closely with, um, with uh, 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 just quickly, uh, have, can you see the tab that I've got it on you? Itzhak Benzvi. All I see is Mayor teasing. Oh man, Gavin, because I'm doing this incorrectly. Come on, Gavin. All right, my apologies, people. Okay, there's the dude, Pinas Rutenberg, that I was talking about there now. Is, yeah, yeah. There is, right? Okay, boom. Well, sorry about that, man. I'm jumping from tab to tab, but it doesn't actually follow no me problem. like that. I have to do it within this. Okay, so that's the guy. This, he was literally implicated in assassinating a guy by the name of uh, Father Kapun in, um, in Russia. As you can see here, he played an active role in two Russian revolutions in 1905 and 1917. He also helped find, again, I was talking about the Jewish Legion. Remember, that was found with the help of Leo Amory, the guy from the Round Table movement, which we will get back to that. Uh, then Ben Zvi, Yitzhak Ben Zvi. So let me just look this dude up. There you go. All right, this guy, he was the second and longest serving president of Israel. He worked very closely with um, David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister. Mm -hmm. And he actually helped to find the first underground military organization and from the gecko, this dude had outlined a plan of how they were going to take basically Israel through underground military kind of tactics. And what's really interesting about this dude as well is in 1924, he ordered the assassination. Okay, 1924, he ordered the assassination of another Jewish guy by the name of Jacob Israel Dahan. Okay, let me see if I can just look this up. Okay, there he is there. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, he, he was a he was a Dutch Too peaceful. <laughs> and well, he was basically at first he, he was interested in Zionism. He was interested in establishing a Jewish state, and then when he got there, he became disillusioned. And so he was yeah. an influential writer, and so he opposed um, uh, the state of Israel, and they assassinated yeah. him. So assassination, targeted assassination, has been a long-standing policy of the jewish establishment in israel the zionist establishment specifically zionism was not a popular thing that's what people just simply do not recognize it was not 
a popular thing. Um, and there's a, a book here that I just want to look up very quickly that people can go check out called, there you go, Rise and Kill First by Ronan Bergman. And it talks about the secret history of Israel's targeted assassinations. And he's like an establishment historian, but you can learn about some of the targeted assassinations. There's a very, very long history involved in all of that. And then finally, let's talk about this dude, Vladimir Zahev Jabotinsky. Oh, there's he's the, the most guy, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's the most commemorated figure in Israel's history. So there are more streets, more buildings more landmarks named after him he also graced their their money than any other figure in their history and he also uh -huh. was instrumental in founding the jewish legion and i didn't illuminate this my apologies the jewish legion fought for the british empire during world war one they were actually the force that came into palestine and conquered palestine okay so there's a close relationship between the british empire and the zionist jews from from the very beginning and this guy was the founder of something called revisionist zionism okay you can see over there he was a revisionist zionist leader the reality is he was he wasn't just a leader he was the founding father of revisionist zionism revisionist zionism is to keep it very simple uh, let's share this i mean let's stop okay revisionist zionism is this notion some people may have heard of the greater israel project or the um, Zionist project for the Middle East, something along those lines. What they had in mind was a very large tract of land. So he wasn't, none of these people were religious. Okay, Mayor Dizenhoff, I haven't been able to find any I information on his proclivities in that regard. But David uh, Ben Gurion wasn't religious, um, Itzhak Ben Zvi wasn't religious, uh, Jabotinsky wasn't religious, all of them, they scoffed at religion. Okay. Yeah. They were very happy to quote the Torah and the Bible to justify their claims to Israel. And sure. one of the things they did was they said that the original kingdom of David, the kingdom of the 12 tribes of Israel or the kingdom of Judah, more specifically, that's the land that they feel entitled to. And um, I suppose, let me see if I can quickly um, bring up a map of that so people can see it to get an image uh of, of what specifically that represents and encapsulates because it's a massive swath of land and when you see that then you will understand why they were that they are so fixated on expanding their borders okay so while i put and that they out saw, they saw saw an opportunity to use religions to foot to to galvanize people into 100 following this course even though they were they themselves could have cared less in fact many of them were very anti-religion if they were you know if the, if the oh, yeah. marxist you know was thoroughly through them marxism has no patience for religion at all you know i mean in many 100%. ways it does away with it you know yeah so 100 so, so, so the way to understand and to contextualize the figures i just mentioned specifically david ben Gurion. And Vladimir Zahev Jabotinsky. David Ben Gurion was like the father of the Labour Zionist movement, which was the left wing. All right, so to keep it easier for people to digest, it's like the Democrats, but a really extreme version, the extreme left wing. And then Vladimir Zahev Jabotinsky, he was the founder of revisionist Zionism, which was the right wing, so Republicans, but an extreme right wing. So they're not comparable, but just so people can understand, there's a bit of a distinction right. there, right, within their minds. Now, both of them, although they certainly differed in how they were going to accomplish their goals, one thing they both agreed upon is they wanted an Arab minority. They wanted to displace the Arab majority right. with a Jewish majority. So uh, immediately, that's very confrontational. That's very insidious. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a publication here, just to show people how far back this goes, entitled, can, this, can we get this to come up? So, so the, let me just, I just want to say this. So the, the Jews were the minority. Okay. Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Oh, clearly historically accurate. They were the minority, but their aspirations and plans were not to simply live in peace. It, the, no. the, that was not what their agenda was. 
they, nope. they were not um, provoked and, and, and tr they were living amongst Palestinians um, for a while, but, but their aspirations and their warlike uh, tendencies, you know, quickly made them unpopular as, as any Russian and China uh, nationalists who moved to America and were the minority, but had openly declared that soon they would no longer be the minority and they would take the majority by force. They might make a few enemies, you know, they uh, might 100%. just rub people the wrong way. <laughs> exactly. So this is, this is history. This is what actually fucking happened. You know, yeah. not, not this nonsense that you've been sold. Exactly. Anyway, so go ahead. Go ahead. So <laughs> first thing I just want to show people to give people a, a view. This is something behind revisionist Zionism. This is what they wanted, okay? And this is what they still want. King David's empire. And as you can see, this goes way beyond what we recognize today as Israel. This goes, it goes into Egypt. It goes into Syria. It goes into the Jordan. And one of the ways in which this was articulated as early as uh, 1923 in a publication entitled The Iron Wall. This was written by Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky. And just so people know, this was a very smart guy. He's recognized by academics and historians as being kind of like a Renaissance man. He spoke many, many languages. He was very well cultured. He was a clever guy. That is undeniable. Nobody can deny that. And what is actually um, what I admire a bit more about him than the modern day guys is he was very unambiguous, man. He spoke very plainly about what he had in mind. And he spoke about how they are going to have to colonize the region. And he said, look, of course they don't have it in here. Oh, no, there it is. Okay, fantastic. It is there. Okay, let me see if I can blow this up so you can read it. So can mm -hmm. you see, have I got it on the page where it says Iron War Essay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. So he wrote this in 1923, which is the first thing, right? And you can see uh, he wrote the essay, um, and basically it's about having a Zionist settlement on the east bank of the Jordan River. And... Um, it was actually on both sides. No, this was Winston Churchill, excuse me, saying you can't have one on the east side of the Jordan River. To put that into context and perspective, that means you can't have a Jewish state also in Jordan because that was what they wanted. They wanted to, to expand, like I said, to the, the borders of the kingdom of David, which is massive. Right. Okay. And it's a point of contention about how historically accurate that is. Mm -hmm. Like I said, he wasn't religious, but he was more than happy. There was a very strong... And I suppose we'll get there. Sorry, I'm starting to jump all over the place here. It's all okay. right. So yeah, we can see a very significant quote from this. And this helps to contextualize the position. And he, this is why I said at least he had the balls to spell out what he had in mind. And he said, Zionist yeah. colonization must either stop or else proceed regardless of the native population. Hmm. which means that it can proceed and develop only under the protection of a power that is independent of the native population behind an iron wall, which the native population cannot breach. And he goes on further to talk about how they need to have a military, a strong military power. He, he's really con yeah, hmm. he, well, he's really considered the, the father of modern Jewish militancy. And hmm. he was a, a bit of a proponent of kind of the new Jew. He was this concept of the new Jew, all right? He was a, a disciple of a guy by the name of Max Nordo. So as you can imagine, th there's always figures that are influenced by somebody before, just as we are influenced by other people. Right. Yeah, so too is the same with him. And this leads us to something to understand Vladimir Jabotinsky and then revisionist Zionism and the ethos and how that has infiltrated um, or, or come to define the state of Israel, we can quickly just explore Max Nordo. Very quickly, we don't have to go too much into him, but Max Nordo, very prominent Zionist, he was actually one of Theodor Herzl's best friends and one of his advisors. And uh, he came up with this idea of, of course they don't have it up here, so now I'm going to have to probably look it up or maybe it's somewhere in here. There you go, muscular Judaism. Okay, and this was a new concept. <laughs> Yeah, some of the most anti-Semitic individuals of their time were themselves, in fact, Jews. So they would frown upon how Jews were conventionally. They said that they were weak. They had these office jobs. They needed to become strong. And they needed to create this new Jew. And that's what muscular yeah. 
Judaism was about. And Vladimir Zaev Jabotinsky was a big proponent of this, and so he vouched usually for militancy. And he was instrumental in the founding of something called the Batoa Naval Academy, the Batoa Youth Group, very Nazi-like um, kind of thing. Let's, let me stop sharing that. I can articulate this a bit because I'm getting too hung up on the slides. It's going to detract from me being able to just speak on this and inform people. So Max Dorto was a, a very prominent figure, very influential behind the scenes. Like I said, he was a, an advisor to Theodor Herzl and one of his best friends. He was also actually asked to lead the World Zionist Organization, which was the like the government behind the government behind the whole Jewish establishment movement yeah. behind the whole Zionist movement and he actually declined because he said no I'm married to a Christian woman and it'll set a bad example won't go over well yeah <laughs> right and uh, Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky was profoundly influenced by this concept of a new Jew a strong Jew and so he started to really advocate strongly militancy David Ben-Gurion was also influenced by this now they came from oh, a totally yeah different political sides but David Ben-Gurion had the idea more so being having Marxist views that uh, and this is kind of also something that would manifest in Nazi Germany that the land would redeem the people so the Jewish people had to get dug into the economy they had to have an exclusively Jewish economy and this would redeem the new Jew now right. another guy um, that is very significant and we're going to get back in a moment but this is when we get into eugenics okay Another guy that was profoundly influenced by Max Nordor was a guy by the name of Arthur Rupin. Okay, Arthur Rupin. Let me pull him up real quick so people can see who I'm speaking about. And Arthur Rupin, boys and girls, was an actual eugenist. He was an unapologetic, outspoken eugenist. And he also um, worked with Nazi eugenists. He met with them. He, in fact, came from Nazi Germany. And this is where things start to make a bit more sense. Mm. Arthur Rupin, which is this dude over here, he was the first individual, he was in charge of an organization called the Palestine Office. And this Palestine Office was the predecessor to the Jewish agency. The Jewish agency was in mm. control of land purchases, in control of immigration. And so he was the first guy that controlled who was going to immigrate to the state of Palestine. And his whole view of the world was that Ashkenazi Jews were superior to other Jews. So remember I said you get three distinct Jews, which is yeah. Ashkenazi. Um, Ashkenazi is mostly European Jews, Western European Jews. Sephardic, which is from the Mediterranean area. So Italy, Portugal, North Africa. And then the Mizrahi Jews, which is from more Arab countries, he had the view that Ashkenaziism, Ashkenazi Jews, were, were superior. All right. Um, and I'm sure I can probably pull up something in here. This is one of the good things, just to quickly help people. Yeah, I'll teach a, a course on this too, about how to do research. In Wikipedia, guys, although Wikipedia is undeniably full of shit, if you always go look at the sources, you can actually get some good information. So you see over here, mm -hmm. I put in the search term eugenics. You, you press control F, you can quickly do that. And then you go to Zionist eugenics, mixed marriage and the creation of a new Jewish type. Now I've also, of course, downloaded publications of Arthur Rupin specifically speaking on these things. Um, but to make a long story short, he was a seminal figure and he's actually recognized as the um, the father of Zionist settlement. Now, there's a lot of different names and titles because Baron Edmund de Rothschild is recognized as the father of Palestinian colonization. But he's recognized mm. as the father of Zionist settlement. And a lot of people don't know who Arthur Rupin is, but he was a major, major, major figure. Arthur Rupin um, was in charge, like I said, of settling the immigrants in the country. And he wanted only Ashkenazi Jews. All right. Only Ashkenazi Jews. Mm. I'm going to see if I can bring this up here very quickly. Um, and if you look also at the earliest accounts of the immigrants that were coming in, and even to this day, the leadership of, of the 
state of Israel is made up overwhelmingly of Ashkenazi Jews. That's not to say that there's not overlapping, but it reflects his ideology, his view, yes, his view that he wanted only Ashkenazi Jews. And he was all about eugenics. In the, in the middle of World War II, he met with one of the leading eugenists from Nazi Germany. And for people to understand That's eugenics, right. it's not just about white supremacy. That's an oversimplification because there were Indian eugenists, there were Japanese eugenists, there were Chinese eugenists. The, uh, China's one um, child policy was about eugenics. It's, it's essentially yeah. at the highest levels. It's about elitism and there started to be a lot of um, diversity and people changing the interpretation of it. And of course, in Nazi Germany, they got the ideas from America, specifically a guy by the name of Madison Grant. And Madison Grant was um, funded overwhelmingly by the Rockefeller family. Shocker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so let, let me go ahead. I'm going to share the screen here and we can check out some stuff here. Okay, so this is a publication called Jewish Eugenics from a, a guy, Professor John Glad. And this is page 188. And you see of your architect of Jewish settlements in Palestine, Arthur Rupin writes in his diary, I am becoming increasingly aware of the extent to which the Jews return to Eretz Israel and agriculture should be seen as a primary eugenic phenomenon. Okay. Wow. Primary eugenic phenomenon. Another quote from him, Arthur Rupin, who was also the head of the World Zionist Organization office in Palestine, writes in his book, 1930-1931, uh, The Sociology of the Jews, that and I quote, in order to preserve the purity of our race, Jews displaying signs of genetic defects should not have children. He maintains that Ashkenazic Jews are not Semites and considers Oriental and Sephardic Jews, whose Semitism he recognizes as inferior. Rupin finds a book by a racial theoretician, who, if I'm not mistaken, became a, a, a Nazi, Hans Gunther, in a Tel Aviv bookstore, and comments in his diary, and I quote, it brings on many thoughts that I had in mind for my own book. And then lastly, architect of Jewish settlements in Palestine. And these are all coming from John Glad's publication, Jewish Eugenics. You can go and look all of this up for free on archive.org, guys. You just create yourself an account. It's free to do so. Excellent, excellent resource to get a hold of academic publications without having to dish out all of the cash. And oftentimes these academic publications that have very incriminating information in them are extremely pricey. Like they can cost thousands of dollars. Yeah. Novia had explained that architect of Jewish settlements in Palestine and eugenicist Arthur Rupin in an article entitled, and I quote, Selection of the Fittest, explains, and I quote, it would mm. naturally be desirable to have only racially pure Jews entering Palestine but a direct influence on the process by selecting those immigrants who most closely approach this racial type is not a practical possibility. It would, of course, be preferable to have only strong and healthy persons come to settle in Palestine so that we would be assured a strong and healthy succeeding generation. Unfortunately, this greatly desired objective cannot be implemented with such generalized simplicity. Okay, so we can see over there, this guy, is, he's one of the founding fathers of Israel. He's never spoken yeah. about, but he was... A very strong proponent of eugenics. Like I said, I didn't have all the time to put together a meticulous yeah. um, slideshow. I have all the details that show he met, he met with Nazi leaders and also showing the immigration statistics where you, you see these very large numbers of Ashkenazi Jews coming on early in. And I'm going to teach, mm -hmm. uh, I'll do a masterclass online for that so people can check nice. it out. But you can clearly see he has a very strong component of eugenics. And this guy was in charge of land purchases he was in charge of the immigrants coming in and he held that position for decades for yeah. decades in the very beginning so there's another finding mm. for this so what we have is we have an ebb and flow where we've got on one side these radical jews that are coming in that comprise the founding fathers and we'll get it more into what they did and how they started to really engage in actual insane levels Ter of terrorism massacres Terror. killing yeah. indiscriminate killings innocent people children false rape. flags i mean false, false flags, flags. 120 year old false flags where they're just setting up their own people to be slaughtered they do this you know yeah it's just, crazy uh, crazy stuff man uh, i mean also especially with labor zionism so the thing with revisionist zionism and vladimir vladimir zahev jabotinsky david ben Gurion used to call him actually vladimir hitler and uh, he had he had no problem calling Vladimir Zevich, uh, yeah he called Vladimir Jabotinsky a Nazi he called him you know the, it's just a weapon for propagandists that's what people don't yeah. understand the, the proverbial Gentile what uh, the rest of us don't understand is 
propagandists, it doesn't matter their ethnicity, it doesn't matter their skin color, it doesn't matter their religion. No. They'll weaponize anything that is a hot That's topic. Right. And so naturally he would weaponize us against other fellow Jews. Oh, you're Hitler. Right. Oh, you're, you're a fascist and so on because they, they didn't agree. But what's interesting about David Ben-Gurion and the labor Zionist movement is while uh, Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky clearly on the surface was far more radical because he was frankly more unapologetic in himself authentically mm-hmm. himself David Ben-Gurion was more cryptic and he was more underhanded and later he revealed himself to be incredibly authoritarian and dictatorial and um, yeah. of course the two converged and they, and they united later on for the purpose of authoritarianism and statism and, uh, and terrorism but um, mm-hmm. you know long story short let me also just go quickly to my, my file here on, uh, on eugenics there was an undeniable um Oh uh, yeah, and yeah, we go. Let me just see this. He was in charge of something called the Palestine Land Development Company. You see, established in 1908. I'm sorry, I'm just going to read this because it's just too much to share a screen and yeah. do this. It was established in 1908. Okay, so that's how early this dude was in operation. A German Jew, as part of the World Zionist Organization, the Palestine Land Development Company, used Jewish national fund and private monies. And by the way, he was also sponsored by Baron Edmund de Rothschild. He also received mm-hmm. money. So he's always in the background, this dude. Um, and at the same time, of course, what's he doing? He's, he's funding the anti-Semitic regime of uh, the Tsar Alexander III in Russia. Oh, how convenient. And of course, this extends to Nazi Germany later on. And so he was uh, seminal in all of it. It explains that the... Um, The PLDC, the Palestinian Land Development Company, bought nearly 90% of its land from large landowners, which we can get into that as well. Um, And many of the transactions were controversial, right? They they were underhanded and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there there was this very strong element of eugenics within, um, within the Jewish leadership where they wanted to create something analogous. Well, it's, they called it the new Jew, muscular judaism which is so so important for people to understand because you can't understand the modern state of israel without recognizing what that is without seeing you know what what this is and then as well in addition to that if we take a look at uh for example in israel there was a campaign to sterilize the ethiopian immigrants some people may Yeah, some people may recall that. Um, that right there is what eugenics is all about, guys. So for people yeah. who are familiar, it's a, about allowing the elite classes, the so-called elite classes genetically to proliferate, to have babies, and then those who are considered to be inferior should not be allowed to have babies. To be sterilized, yeah. To be sterilized, right. Such as of yeah, Ethiopian woman in Israel given contraceptive without consent. Right, so so we see this Danish programs, programs all over the world ado- adopted these these ideologies and these sick sick uh, movements. You know, and, and we're just starting to get a full grasp of, of the effects of them because women. You know, I mean, this yeah. has been going on for decades. Well, we have a population, population crisis now that, of course, nobody's speaking about because they've got us all fixated on nuclear warfare, which is. Uh, yeah. overwhelmingly theatrical because th- there's already already a nuclear plan in place where according to Professor Shauna Swan a renowned epidemiologist who has been following and studying and she's not controversial at all to cite the sperm um, decline in the fertility crisis mm. she estimates by 2045 we won't be able to yeah. naturally procreate no. so we'll that, that, that's what you pay, pay laboratory you know yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which nicely uh, that and naturally coincides. Yeah, and that coincides with transhumanism. And transhumanism is actually a term that was coined and popularized by a guy by, a guy by the name of Professor um, Julian Huxley. And Julian Huxley was a member of the British Eugenics Society. He was actually the brother of Aldous Huxley. Mm-hmm. So when Aldous Huxley writes the yeah. books Brave New World, and he, yeah. what he's actually telling you is not so much coming from his imagination as coming from actual mm-hmm. reality and being close to that right. movement and that establishment. And what they want. Yeah. Yeah. What their goals. Okay, yeah, so man. Um, 
let me explain okay so we kind of covered that uh, i'll provide yeah. a more in-depth look at everything when i do the uh the master class i'll come up with better slides this has been so busy man it's a yeah don't worry a full-time it. day Let's... man you know how that goes but labor yeah. zionism we're gonna now get into the connections with zionist or, or with nazi germany so so first let's establish okay how do you want to contextualize this gavin you're jumping all over the place let's go with how we slowly well first let me ask you brother do you have any questions about anything in specific i mean i'm always curious about ask anything man it doesn't even have to be related specifically to what i mentioned because there's all kinds of other things yeah. that i can provide some insight on you know what what boggles my mind is is how, like you know i know there's literal so oftentimes physical connections between nazi germany and the zionist movement i know that that in actuality israeli government brought in nazi um hire military people to then 100% train the, the Mossad yeah the, the, well the Mossad you used know. a guy by the name of Otto Skorzeny who was one of Hitler's right hand men he's one of his his favorite right. spies and this guy actually saved Mussolini <laughs> go look him up yeah. Otto Skorzeny yeah and, and he, so came, he, he, was, he was brought into the Mossad and he worked for the Mossad yeah just like Operation Paperclip in the US man same thing yeah shit. but and and so you know you have this notion that that Israel was started as a safe haven from from further Nazi prosecution and that they needed this um, and yet at the same time they're welcoming into their ranks you know the, the, the these literally people who who have the death of thousands and thousands and thousands um millions of Jewish people on their hands and so like you start to see how what 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 a what a dark and twisted web this is that has been created by these so-called Jewish, you know, banking elites, particularly the Rothschilds who, you know, had their hands in each and every part of this, positioning it um, for their own reasons, which is control and, and the further their wealth, you know, and, and, and so people don't understand. People think this is biblical. It ain't fucking biblical. It's fucking, not at all. It's it's, it's corporate, no. okay? You yeah, know, not at all. Anything. They've they've used the thing really is they've used the biblical narrative as any yeah. parasite or predator does. I mean, the the proverb it's ancient uh, is all you need to know. It personifies exactly what this is all about, which is the proverbial wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah. And what what the way the agent of deception operates, which is why I specifically want to teach a course on this notion that extends beyond the trappings of tribalism and ideology and religion and so on is that they will wear any mask of authority that you will blindly yes. and unthinkingly obey so if you are religious they're going to wear religious clothing this is right. why oftentimes what you will find is you will find predators um, specifically pedophiles in positions where they are entrusted to take care of children right yeah. it's not it's not that there's specifically a problem in the in the catholic church or uh boys and girls clubs or you know so on and so forth it's that the predator is a predator first and foremost and it will wear whatever thing you least suspect right. so it can gain access to its victims that's how it has traditionally operated and that is how it will operate forever because yeah. the way that truth operates is it requires investigation it requires being questioned you know why because when you question or investigate for example i like to be questioned why because that's how i can prove my points truth right. wants to be questioned because that's how its power and authority is established exactly. whereas deception relies on blind obedience oh no no don't don't research, don't investigate yeah. exactly don't question just believe and uh you know the vehicle of israel has in that way served this movement which mm. converges with it, it proceeds you know nazism is also an offshoot a later offshoot this this is just elitism that's what it is it's the elitist ideology 
which even precedes the notion of religion even our recognition of races as we see them today because yeah. of our constructs in their own right like this is a very long human story that people takes a lot of yeah. work unfortunately um and another way in which Tell it was personified aside from the fact that they recruited high-ranking nazis is in argentina <laughs> when argentina had a dictatorship <clears throat> in which they also had Nazis that were funneled through the rat lines by the Central yeah. Intelligence Agency. And these Nazis yeah, went to go work. Yeah, well, I mean, people like Adolf Eichmann, for example. Adolf Eichmann, they basically, you can go look this up, even on the BBC, where Royal Dutch um, Airport Transportation Company, which at that time was controlled by Prince Bernard of the Netherlands. Prince Bernard yeah. of the Netherlands, who was a former SS official, he was a former Nazi, okay? Yeah, he was in control of this airline, and this airline helped Nazis escape. And one of the places That's that right. they helped them escape to was Argentina. And anyways, Argentina. during this dictatorship, they were committing these horrible atrocities, including against the local Jewish community. And guess mm-hmm. who was who was arming and funding them and providing training? The state of Israel. Oh. The state <laughs> of Israel. Yeah, no joke, oh. brother. Yeah, yeah, that's what. That's I, all I, bullshit, man. And it's all bullshit, <laughs> and people don't understand that. People. People don't see the big picture. They don't understand the fact that the, 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 the Jews that were killed in, in World War II were sacrificed at the altar of 100%. Zionism. 100%. You know? And you know what? We can even Happily get into it. by the Rothschilds, you know? I mean, this, was a, this uh, is you, what they needed. Even the Rothschilds, man. So you know David Ben-Gurion, right? He's recognized yeah. as the father, father of um, the primary father of the state of Israel. And for a long time, he was like kind of the golden child in terms of public relations and advertising they try to avoid more revisionist zionism because within yeah. revisionist zionism there was the ergon which we can get into in, in a bit the ergon was a literal terrorist organization carried out horrible massacres king david That's hotel right. bombing did crazy crazy shit but we david talked Ingram, about them in the last podcast too yeah yeah david well i've learned so much more man wild shit but david ben Gurion. He was actually so obsessed with the creation of a Jewish state that he thwarted the efforts of rescuing Jews from Nazi Germany. Yeah. Him and Chaim Weizmann. Chaim Weizmann was the first president of Israel. So if you look at the Evian Conference, and you can actually find this information on Wikipedia. Let me go look it up quickly. Um, it's because it's easy for me to... I can probably find it also in my in all my slides and stuff but man unfortunately i'm not fully prepared yeah, but, for it. But to tell everyone what they what they did because this is fucking important this is what people people don't want to believe and they, oh, and they shit, have a hard time understanding you yeah, know th- the fact that they 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 did not want that they needed up to bolster the body count this is what they do yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. um let me just Okay, so while I'm looking for this, I can articulate it. Let's see if you can multitask here, Gavin. Essentially, if you go look up the Evian Conference, this was um, a conference that was set up in 1938, and it was set up by multiple governments, including the United States, to address what they clearly saw as these programs against Jews, and specifically in Germany. Like, okay, what are we going to do? And one of the primary results of this was that it was massively unproductive, because the powers that be did not want to take in these Jewish immigrants. Now, of course, we know about this now, and it's framed as, oh, just, you know, the American government in in Europe were just being totally heartless and so on. But what has been overlooked in this is the fact that Chaim Weizmann, the first president of Israel, and David Ben-Gurion, who at that time were working for the Jewish agency, they were literally lobbying they were dissuading mm-hmm. all the governments so from taking in That's Jews. Right. They only wanted Jews to go to Palestine. That was their right. thing. And there's or a new back book. to Germany to get killed. Well, the, yeah, exactly. That's a no, really. That, that is it right there, man. Um, yep. And let me see. I, I want to show people that you can even see this shit now today. Excuse me, on Wikipedia. Okay, so you see over here. Okay, let me just get rid of that there. Zionist leaders Chaim Weizmann and Dave Ben-Gurion of the Jewish Agency were both firmly opposed to Jews being allowed entry into Western countries, hoping that the pressure of hundreds of thousands of refugees having nowhere to go would force Britain to open Palestine to Jewish immigration, which that's another story, right, to, which we can get into. I suppose let me quickly articulate that. 
um, touch on that and, and not go into it. But there you can clearly see they were opposed, guys. Boom. Mm-hmm. Never mind that there's a, a, a Holocaust that's precipitating you. Right. Right. This is literally during the Holocaust. Well, no, no, this wasn't in the, the actual Holocaust. This was when the pogroms were going on and people realized. So it was recognized that these serious Jewish persecution going on. And it was the beginning stages. It was taking place, but right. people didn't know about it. Okay. On a right. major scale. Another thing is the Jewish agency, when they did become aware of the Holocaust, they waited for months before they shared the information <laughs> publicly. You know what um, they needed? The body count. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things with the, the British restricting immigration is that for decades they had been promising the Arab and Palestinians that they would um, curtail immigration because there were lots of underhanded maneuverings taking place there were illegal immigrants mm-hmm. coming in and the Palestinians slowly began to realize and recognize what we spoke about earlier where there was this methodical policy that they were going to get rid of the Arab majority displace them basically kick them out of the country and replace them one way or another which we see going on today this is a continued mm-hmm. action it's a continued ideology it's why today what's going on is literally genocide, where they wanted yeah. to displace the majority population with the Jewish population. And so they required that there's going to be some kind of restriction on Jewish immigration. Now, that didn't mean that it was going to stop entirely, but they wanted right. it to be restricted because it was exploding. And with it exploding, um, another big thing that people don't talk about is that there was also uh, large weapons caches in 1935, which preceded the something known as the Arab Revolt between 1936 and 1939, major mm-hmm. event. But what preceded that, one of the major events, is something called the Cement Incident. The Cement Incident is when they found a, a massive illegal weapons cache of British-made machine guns. These were guns mm-hmm. being used in war that were being smuggled into the country. And this freaked out the Palestinians big time because they yeah. said, okay, well, they're already trying to oust us. And now they've got all of these guns coming in and they're manufacturing yeah, grenades. <laughs> like, this is, a, this is a bit of a problem, right? Um, so that's why the immigration was being restricted on that level. It wasn't being completely throttled. <clears throat> but in recognition of this, now let's say you're in a position, you're a Jewish person, you know that these persecutions are taking place. Don't you want to just save Jews? Right? Don't you want to encourage the European <laughs> yeah. governments and the US governments? Don't you right? want to rescue the hostages? How is carpet bombing achieving that? Oh, it's not. That's right. That's yeah, right. 100%, it's not. Man. If you it's... say that the Palestinians are using the, the Jews as uh, body armor or whatever, then why are you carpet bombing thousands of Palestinians make it make sense because none of the propaganda you've been sold is logical anyway that's all I'm saying to people who are continuing this fucking idiocy that like parroting the fucking rhetoric they've been fed by the legacy media and by Israeli propaganda machines it's just absurd sorry I had to I had to get that no 100% brother (laughs) you you need to let it loose man you gotta let the it's all of us, we, all of us, need, you know, on some level, we need to be informed, obviously, but we need to go ahead and speak out because, and we must try to do so with temperament, but we yeah. need to speak out because when we don't, we acquiesce to these these hateful fucking people who aren't informed, and they're unapologetically mm-hmm. and loudly ignorant, and that's problematic, man. But what I just yeah. want to quickly share with you is uh, is this quote, man, this shocking, shocking quote from David Ben-Gurion that also helps to encapsulate his his view. And this is from a, a book entitled was recently published called A State at Any Cost, which is mm. which is exactly what was what it was all about, specifically for David yeah. Ben-Gurion. A state at any cost. Okay. Okay, so let me go over here. All right, there you go. DV. Yeah. yeah. The uh, David Ben-Gurion. And he had this infamous quote, and this is a credentialed historian, um, this is not a controversial quote. You can go look it up for yourself, guys, to get the context. But he says, and I quote, if I knew that, it, because this, uh, so basically to give the proper context, England had engaged in an operation where it saved thousands of children from Germany. Okay, public pressure demanded that they go ahead and they save some children. They did so. They saved thousands of kids, mm-hmm. some Jewish kids from Germany. And then David Ben-Gurion went in and said this in response. If I knew that it was possible to save all the children in Germany by transporting them to England, but only half by transporting them to Palestine, 
I would choose the second. Because we face not only the reckoning of these children, but the historical reckoning of the Jewish people. Now, if you are willing to say that publicly, what are you saying privately? <laughs> My like God. That, that's that's insane. So so you are willing to sacrifice half of those kids just so you can find the state of Israel, right? That just goes to show you where where, where they were at mentally and what they the lengths they're still they're willing to go to. They're they're willing to kill their own. Yeah, no, hundred you know? percent, man. So so here's another example of that. Uh, with okay, this is a state at any cost again. Page two hundred and seventy nine, I think. Can't really read how I cited this, but again, people can put these search terms in archive.org and it'll come up. And what he basically talks about this was after the British started to restrict immigration, right? He basically had in mind that he would land a massive amount of illegal Jewish immigrants in Palestine, and if they were shot at by the British soldiers. That would serve his purpose because there would be terrible public relations for the British Empire. Yeah. So he, he was very calculated, a very calculated politician. Yeah, they wanted the British Empire out, so they were willing to fall, you know, false flag to do that. Yeah, well, you see, there's yeah. a whole other dimension to that, man. This is when the Round Table group also comes in because they were still working with him. Okay, so let, let's right. touch on that quickly to, to provide a bit of, of clarity. Um, and also just one more thing, actually, before we move forward. The transfer yeah. agreement, the Havara agreement, right? Let's let's go ahead and let's touch on this because this is such such a significant um, piece of history, man. That also has not been shared uh, appropriately and correctly with us. Oh, not that button. So the Havara agreement, which is sometimes called the transfer agreement, this was in 1933. This was when Hitler was in power. Can you see that? The yeah. Havara agreement. Okay, fantastic. So this was in 1933, right? And there was a massive worldwide boycott of uh, German products taking place, okay? Massive, mm -hmm. massive boycott of German products taking place. This had a crushing effect on them economically. They couldn't continue yeah. with it. One of the most notable things historically that has worked against the ruling class, whether you look at the cessation of the plebs oh, in yeah. ancient Roman history, which was like in the fourth century BC, or more recently with the truckers protesting against the vaccine mandates, is civil disobedience when we just yeah. collectively say no. So with Nazi Germany, when they were faced with this boycott of their goods, they were in economic shambles right well then they went ahead and they did a deal with the zionist leadership the predecessors mm -hmm. to israel and just to be very clear because the way this gets framed is that they did this to save jews from germany right the reality is that this was more so for elitist jews because what it was about was transferring right. their wealth from germany it was about transferring the goods it wasn't about getting the jews to Palestine. No. Hitler himself actually said that he would send uh, the Jewish people off first class. That's how bad he wanted yeah. to get, get rid of the Jews. And, and, and look, there's this other side of the story where Hitler's this hero. Hitler was not a hero. That's also ridiculous no. bullshit, man. It's propaganda. Totally. Exactly. It's, it's no different than pick, pick the left or pick the right. We're giving you two That's options. Right. Nothing exists beyond that. Don't think, don't use your imagination. Don't look internally, look externally for answers. And so he, that's what he said. He he was willing to pay to get rid of the Jewish class. Yeah. So that's what the Havara Agreement, in spite of <laughs> what is popularized in the linguistic gymnastics they engage yeah. in to make it seem Bullshit like oh, this, this was about saving, no, this was about getting the assets of wealthy Jews out of right. Germany. And so what they did in order to facilitate this agreement is they got rid of the Jewish boycott against Nazi Germany. So Nazi, guess what? Nazi Germany could have probably ended right then and there. But the Zionist yeah. leadership, again, with their virulent fixation on the creation of a state in Palestine. And they knew they needed it. They knew that what they were going to need to do that. Yeah, which, which was you highly know. unpopular, man. Again, most Jews had no interest in immigrating to no. Palestine, uh, which is further personified later on in the early 1950s through actual terrorist attacks in Middle Eastern yeah. countries to in encourage massive immigration into yeah. Israel and and the Mizraic Jews that arrived there if you look at Professor Avi Schleim and his account because he was one of them how they were sprayed they sprayed them with DDT they treated them like shit there was racism to Jewish right. yeah Jewish people being racist towards Jewish people I mean 
Yeah. Story of the humans, man. Humans are a funny, funny breed sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. so, so that encapsulates some of the Nazi relations. And on Vladimir Zahev, uh, Jabotinsky, and the revisionist Zionist side, they were, they thought it was reprehensible to work with um, Nazi Germany. However, Vladimir Zahev, Jabotinsky had no problem working with Mussolini. In fact, yeah. He, yeah, in fact, he founded a naval academy. Let me go look this up real quick. The Batar Naval. Yeah, Bataan Naval Academy. So the Bataan Naval Academy, right, was uh, basically a predecessor to Israel's Navy. So a lot of people mm. from Israel's Navy went to the Bataan Naval Academy. Let me see. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and share that quickly. Uh, what time is it where you are, cousin? I don't want to keep you up late, man. What time uh, is it? It's almost been? midnight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, hey, look, we can we can break this up into a second one if you want to do that. Yeah, man. we might have to. We might have Jeez, to. Jeez, um, I had no idea it was so late by you, don't man. Don't worry about it, brother. It's a yeah. It, it wouldn't even be that bad. I've just been I've been going nonstop all day. Um, no, I, I we, think let's we'll wrap it up. We'll have to man. break it up. Yeah, <gasps> we'll have like to. A, and we've been going on for almost what over two and a half hours. My goodness. Yeah, it's fucking time flies, man. Um, <laughs> There's just so much information to go through and so much to lay out. But listen. Let's plan to pick it up and we'll do, we'll just do another two part because I mean, we just, we got to go through, we went through a lot, but we could still, let's still make our way up into. It's a nice um, way to start off the next one with Nazi Germany. We'll pick back up with the Zionist Nazi relationship. Um, and um, I'm wishing you well, brother, uh, health and happiness to you and your family. And I'm here for you. Let me know what I can do to help. Um, uh, you've been amazing, man. Whatever it is, bro. <laughs> no. uh, I'm happy. I'm happy to help because you're doing really important work, and I and I want to see it get out more. You know, I want to see it reach more people because people need to be, people need the knowledge. You know, it's yeah, it, sure, ignorance is, is part of the veil that this, you know, that that's keeping us from evolution. So I'm I'm all for it. But hey, I appreciate man. your time, man. I appreciate your work so much, and um, yeah, man, I love you, bro. Love um, you too, man. Good. Good luck with everything, and um, you know I'm, I'm gonna catch some Z's, but we're gonna reconnect. Get some fucking we'll Z's, man. I had no idea it was so late. So I'm sorry about that, man. Fuck. No, no, it's not your fault, bro. No, this nice schedule. This, I, look, we're on opposite sides of the planet. You were like 12 hours apart, so we had to do it when we could do it. So uh, I'm glad we, we, we got into it. Just 12 hours, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, man, bro. look, you you get some sleep, brother, and we'll chat again Thanks, soon, brother. man. All okay, right. bro. Thank you, Gavin. All right. Thanks, brother. Okay, cool, man.